Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Oklahoma's wheat crop is ahead of schedule this year and not without its share of challenges. For an update, we turn to our Extension Small Grain Specialist, Jeff Edwards. By and large, the Oklahoma wheat crop is in pretty good shape. Uh, the recent rain really breathes some more life into our crop and in many circumstances we almost have enough moisture in the soil now to go ahead and finish out the crop. Now, there are a few areas where the crop was a little too far gone due to drought and it wasn't able to bounce back and it's, it's not really going to recover. Uh, another example of the crop where it's not in quite as good of shape would be some of our producers because of the price, the cost of inputs and the way everything was looking did not invest in top dressed nitrogen. That is really starting to show up in, in those fields. Uh, but as a whole, I, I think we're on our way to an average crop. I would say the wheat crop is about a week to 10 days ahead of schedule. Uh, if current conditions hold, I, I think we'll probably be harvesting some wheat before the end of May in, in southwest Oklahoma. We're a little farther ahead. Uh, our temperatures, though, have cooled off a little bit. Uh, we're more in the 60s and 70s. That will slow things down, and it's actually a very good thing for the wheat crop. Uh, these cooler temperatures will help us fill out those grains, make larger grains. Uh, so if harvest goes ahead and gets delayed a little bit and we're closer to June 1st, it will actually be a good sign for the wheat crop if, it, if it's due to, to cool temperatures. Now in, in the spring is a really good time to, uh, to look at weeds. Uh, in a perfect world, there wouldn't be any weeds out there and we would have them controlled. But a lot of our grassy weeds that are really hard to control are also hard to identify in the fall. Uh, now with the seed head on those grassy weeds, they're fairly easy to identify. So it's a good idea to go out and look at fields, make note of what grassy weeds are out there and where they are so you can choose a product uh, in the coming fall that will allow you to control those weeds. Some of our foliar diseases such as stripe rust, the cooler wet conditions really favor stripe rust and it's the most uh, one of the most aggressive diseases that we deal with. Uh, our farmers in southwest Oklahoma really were kind of past the window. We still have a bit of a window in northern Oklahoma. Uh, depending on the product that you're using, you need to look closely at those label restrictions. Some of them have a growth stage restriction where you can't spray after flowering. Others have a pre-harvest interval. So it's really important to uh, make sure you know those label restrictions and that you adhere to those. Generally, after the wheat is flowered, there's not a lot we can do. Uh, we still need to monitor. There are a few insect pests that could be out there causing us problems, but most of the time our fungicide applications have been made by then, and a lot of it's up to Mother Nature at, at that point. So uh, the best thing we can do at that point is start greasing the combines and preparing for harvest. We want to get an update now on wheat disease. We're joined by Bob Hunger, our extension wheat pathologist. And Bob, you've been out and about around Oklahoma. What kind of things are you seeing? Well, there's, there's started to be that transition from stripe rust to leaf rust. Uh, spent quite a bit of this last week in uh, south central, southwestern Oklahoma. And uh, you can see where stripe rust has done damage to susceptible varieties, especially if a fungicide was not used. In cases where they had a susceptible variety and a fungicide was used, the, the wheat looks, looks very good. And of course, the moisture is much better this year than it has been. You have some examples here in your research plots. Kind of show and tell for us. Okay. Yeah, this is a good example right here of where uh, stripe rust has hit a susceptible variety. And if you look closely at the leaves, uh, you can see, especially on the top part of the leaves, there's still some of the, the orangish, uh, reddish colored sporulation of the stripe rust. But because the temperatures have war has warmed and the uh, uh, wheat has matured quite a bit, if you look at some of the leaves, you can also start to see, especially on the back side, how the uh, orangish pustules are turning into black uh, survival spore stage. And that means that the rust is, is starting to shut down of, uh, for stripe rust. But uh, in this case, the damage has been done because if you look at the overall foliage canopy there, you see that there's just not 
near as much green tissue as there should be because there's been so much stripe rust on this and of course those leaves will die off quicker as, as temperatures warm up and time goes on. And then you also mentioned leaf rust and you have some examples to show us? Yeah, leaf rust is in a different trial and uh, that's, that's the disease that's starting to move in now. Okay, let's go take a look. Okay. Bob, what are you seeing over here? Well, uh, in this trial up here, we, we have uh, uh, not very much stripe rust, and it's turned more into leaf rust. And there's quite a, quite a bit of this starting to show up in here, but it's going to get much, much stronger as, as time goes on. For example, if you look at this leaf here, uh, of course, this is the flag leaf up high. And you can see down here, there's a little bit of stripe rust mixed in there, but the rest of the leaf has more of a brown colored rust on it, which is leaf rust. And this is what's starting to move in now because it does better at a little bit warmer temperatures. So uh, in comparison to the stripe rust, which is shutting down, the leaf rust is just starting to get activated now. And then are there treatment options available at this stage? Most of the wheat across Oklahoma should have been sprayed by now. The stripe rust that we looked at earlier, uh, the wheat is past the stage where it could be sprayed, but also there's such, been such a heavy infection on there, it wouldn't be do any good to spray wheat at that point. You really need to spray the fungicide before the rust becomes as established as it is on, on these plants. And then anything else you're seeing that you want to talk about? <clears throat> Yeah, there's a couple other things. If you look a little further back into this plot, you can see the yellow leaves uh, in right here in a spot in front of me and in the row behind me. And that would be barley yellow dwarf, which is a virus transmitted by aphids. And of course, those aphids were here a long time ago, a month or more ago, and, and transmitted that virus. And so you start to have these little yellowish spots showing up uh, in that. Uh, now, in addition to the barley yellow dwarf, not here around Stillwater, but uh, up in northern uh, Oklahoma, northwestern Oklahoma, we're starting to see wheat streak mosaic virus, which is a virus transmitted by a mite, the wheat curl mite. And it can be very devastating and will show up more as uh, temperatures increase. And you have a fact sheet on that to help yep. explain it more? Sure do, on, on mite transmitted viruses. Okay, Bob, thanks for the update. We'll see you again soon. Yep. And for a link to Bob's fact sheet, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. We saw a lot of weather action on Tuesday of this week. The good news was that no major injuries were reported. Property damage was scattered across the state. Early reports indicated damage in Mustang, Luther, Davis, Tulsa, Copan, and Chicota. In spite of a line of storms from north to south across Oklahoma Tuesday evening that marched from west to east, storm impact was random. In Chickasha at 8.10 p.m., there was a 74-mile-per-hour wind gust that showed up as a bright bullseye. Copan topped that with an 87-mile-per-hour wind gust. How quickly Copan's wind gust spiked is evident in a time series graph. From wind gusts close to 22 miles per hour, wind gusts sailed to 87 miles per hour within 10 minutes. Peak wind gusts on Tuesday included four mesonet sites with 70 or higher wind gusts, nine sites with 58 to 69 mile per hour wind gusts, 71 mesonet sites had maximum wind gusts between 40 and 57 miles per hour. The rains were scattered too in bands and blobs. Rain amounts ranged from a high of 1 and 61 hundredth inches at Medicine Park to 1 one hundredth of an inch at Freedom and Mays Ranch. Hopefully you and yours got rain and dodged damage. Here's Gary with a longer view of this year's precipitation. Thanks Al and good morning everyone. Well we've been getting lots of good rainfall and we have certainly need it. So let's talk about all the moisture we've seen. What a difference a month makes. Look at this Mesonet rainfall total map for the first three months of the year and the percent of normal map. Most areas had one to four inches of rain for that first three month period from January through March, 
or about 60% of normal to even less than 20% of normal. Now this was that period during which drought and fire both sort of skyrocketed. Then along comes April with several strong storm systems and widespread 3 to 7 inch rainfall amounts. Now some areas even had up to 10 inches down across southwestern Oklahoma and the percent or normal rainfall map for April is full of those lovely blues and greens. Now there are still a few areas lacking like the eastern panhandle and east central Oklahoma, at least on this map. So we have drought on the run once again. All we need to do is limit that severe weather and we'll be in good shape. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. It's that time of year where the insects are starting to make their way onto the plants. And Tom, let's talk about some of the insect pressure going on in canola. All right. Well, canola, has, uh, these rains have really invigorated the canola this year. It's, I think it's a wonderful looking crop, a lot of yield potential. And most of the aphid pressure is, is passed now, the flowering's passed, but I still think that if farmers with all the yield potential we have here need to not ignore this crop. Uh, there's a lot of pods out here that are appetizing to a couple of different potential pests and so they shouldn't be ignoring it um, and keep keep looking at it making sure that they carry this through to harvest. What kind of insects are, are, are we seeing on the canola plants right well, now? Well we still f find a few aphids and I, I uh, have some uh, tur turnip aphids here um, like Turnip aphids and cabbage aphids like to get up uh, near the, the tops of the plants. They feed on the flowers and they'll sometimes feed on the uh, pods themselves and right. maybe cause them not to develop quite as fast. Um, I was able to find this patch because there's a lot of lady beetles around here that right. are wanting to eat these things. So um, so that's one of the, the pests. Right. Frankly, there's not enough here to worry about right now, but uh, um, it's one of the things that we've seen occasionally in some of the canola around the state and if, if it got to be high enough numbers on the terminals they'd uh, probably have to treat. The two uh, insects that I'm concerned more about are, are three insects actually, diamondback moth, mm -hmm. corn earworm, and variegated cutworm that like to feed on the pods because okay. they will directly go in and take those seeds out so they're directly removing poten yield potential and it just is important for the, per for the scout or producer to be out here and on a weekly basis look and see what's going on. Uh, if you do it within a, you know, on a weekly basis you should be able to catch anything that's coming in uh, before it causes too much damage and then may be able to make a decision on whether you need to treat or not. Now as, as they're out scouting for these insects, what, what's kind of the threshold to where they actually need to treat? Um, with, uh, with pod feeding insects, uh, sometimes we look at, uh, I guess right now I would say uh, with, with uh, the two pod feeding insects, I'm thinking of two larvae per um, plant. Really? Yeah. Okay. If you have two larvae per plant, that's a, that's an uh, economic threshold. Right. So, um, and sometimes these things will be surprising because there's a lot of litter underneath right. the, the ground here and they, uh, variegated cutworm likes to hide under there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to sometimes uh, get in the field and brush away that to really find them and you'll find these things curled up. Um, I have a a picture from a few years ago where we had a bunch of them and it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, but also be looking and examining the pods for, for holes that are you know, as they're uh, like the caterpillars are feeding. Right. But uh, for, th for the two corn earworm and variegated cutworm we're talking about two per uh, plant or okay. two per square foot. What, what kind of treatment options are there for, for these insects? There is a lot, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, uh, we have a lot of uh, pyrethroids that they're sensitive to that uh, are fairly inexpensive to use. Uh, the key is to just make sure you get good pan canopy penetration with, mm -hmm. the, with the product so that it gets down into the, the plant itself and, and uh, uh, gets them. But uh, yeah, they, they shouldn't be too difficult to uh, control as long as you're getting good coverage. Okay, thank you much, Tom. Mm -hmm. And for more information about what we talked about, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu.
after severe weather, heavy winds, or even just litter bugs and party goers, there's always a chance that animals will consume random debris. SUNUP's Curtis Hare has this story. The unpredictable Oklahoma spring weather has arrived, and with severe storms and high winds, a whole bag of concerns can be dropped on producers throughout the state. Dr. Melanie Boyu is a veterinary clinical sciences professor at OSU, and she says one issue producers need to watch out for is their animals ingesting debris, particularly plastics. You know, any kind of ruminants, whether it's especially cattle, uh, have access to any of those Walmart plastic bags. If they have, you know, if they get to eat one or two, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. But if there's, for some reason, it's blowing and it's all in their pasture and they have readily access to that, then they could eat many. And what can happen is it's, it can either stay in their room and so they have four stomachs and they could just kind of stay and just kind of move around in there and not really go downstream and cause any problems. But if there's enough, because that's not going to degrade, you know, or be digested, it can get um, obstructed or it could cause an obstruction. For cattle, Boyu says it may take a while for the animal to be affected, but there are red flags producers can spot. And one of the signs you're going to see is an animal kind of not feeling very well, uh, not eating very much, maybe decreased stool uh, output, and then gradually over time their belly is going to get bigger and bigger. The best thing people can do is just watch their pastures and make sure that if there's been large wind storms or some other activities that would, would displace a lot of debris is go ahead and check those pastures and make sure that if there's any large quantities of that available that they do go get that cleaned up in a timely fashion or move those animals away from it until they can get that cleaned up. Although debris from storms and high winds is hard to prevent, the carelessness and ignorance of how people dispose of plastics has always been a problem for animals especially wildlife. So we've known for quite a while that a lot of species of wildlife ingest plastic either intentionally or accidentally when foraging and this can be uh, you know plastic bags or uh, balloons and a lot of people don't realize just how many balloons are released in the United States each year and they end up in the environment and a lot of them end up in the gut of some animal. Elmore says people aren't releasing balloons maliciously, but they don't realize how consequential the act can be. So when a balloon is released, you know, it can go for quite a ways, depending on the air currents, before it comes back down. And, you know, once you release it, it's out of your hands, and basically it's littering. Uh, there's no difference in releasing a helium balloon than it is in just throwing a, a cup out on somebody's property. You're littering somewhere, um, so it's breaking the law at a minimum, but it also potentially is being ingested by livestock or wildlife. It's also, you know, aesthetically unpleasing to the landowner. It's just, it's unnecessary and it causes a lot of problems. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, let's take a look at what the market is offering for new crop prices, first and foremost, wheat. Well, there's still some uh, 2015 wheat in the bend. Uh, if you look at the basis for, for that, it's been bid off the KC July contract. It's about $4.80 on the futures price. The basis for old crop wheat's anywhere from a minus a dollar to minus 80 cents, which gives you 380 to $4 in Oklahoma. That harvest delivered wheat, again, bid off July contract, that basis is running from a minus 80 cents to a minus 65 cents gives you a new crop bid of somewhere between four dollars and four dollars and 15 cents a bushel. Give us the rundown on canola too. Well if you look at canola it's just a flat price of about three six dollars and 25 cents a bushel for canola. And we've been talking about crop conditions this week. Uh, let's look at production and how it compares to last year. Well, if you look at Oklahoma wheat production, it'll probably be slightly less than last year. You know, we had 9% uh, less planted acres for wheat, but our crop conditions are significantly better. And I think that's going to mostly offset that reduction in production due to less planted acres. 
And then let's assume that 9% went into summer crops. How is the market looking for summer crops? Well, if you look at uh, corn, uh, you know, if you're out in the panhandle, that's where it's fed. The basis is a minus 15 cents off the Chicago Board of Trade uh, July contract, which is at $4. That gives you a forward contract for corn in the panhandle at about $3.85. Central Oklahoma, it's 20 cents less for a basis of a minus 35 cents. Gives you about $3.65 a bushel. Sorghum, they don't want sorghum in the panhandle. That basis is a minus a dollar and a half. Gives you $2.95 a bushel for sorghum. Central Oklahoma, it's a little more popular to minus 75 cents off that, Dece off that December uh, Chicago contract for uh, corn and it gives you $3.25 a bushel. Soybeans, uh, Central Oklahoma, minus 75 off the Chicago Board of Trade Descon, our November contract, which is, is at 940 uh, for a cash price, a panhandle, a dollar under that, uh, that, Dece that November contract for the beans, our cash price of 915. And I'm assuming conditions looking pretty good for these summer crops, at least as they are getting started. Well, I mean, the rains the last couple of weeks, most of the producers had those summer crops in, are, uh, and they're up. If they didn't, they've got good soil moisture. We've got an excellent start for summer crops in Oklahoma. Okay, Kim Anderson, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Commercial cow-calf producers that are going to be selling calves at weaning next fall are often struggling with the question as to whether to use creep feed to add some extra pounds on those calves uh, at weaning time. Well, that's a question that has lots of variables that enter into it. One of the variables, of course, is the, the feed to gain ratio. In other words, how many pounds of creep feed it takes to put on an extra pound of weight on that calf. And the other side of the equation that we have to address is what's the value of that extra pound of weight that we put on that calf in relationship to the cost of the creep feed. Let's talk about feed conversion first of all. Research has shown us that feed conversions in creep feeding situations can vary quite widely to as low as five pounds of feed to get an extra pound to gain on up to as high as 15, perhaps even close to 20 pounds of feed to get an extra pound of gain. Why the difference? Well, of course, the, the mother becomes involved. How much milk is she giving? Is she an adult cow that's in good body condition in one of those years where there's plenty of grass and she's producing her genetic maximum in terms of milk? That cow, of course, is probably meeting the nutrient needs of that calf and his growth requirements. And the creep feed that's added on top will do very little in terms of increasing weight gain for the amount of feed that, that he consumes. On the other side of the equation might be thin two-year-old cows that, in a, say, a drought situation, aren't giving very much milk. They're in poor body condition, and so uh, their milk production is lower than what their genetic capabilities would be. In that case, their calf benefits from getting some added creep feed going into his diet and improves his uh, rate of gain uh, pretty substantially. So. I think we need to look at our situation each year and go through and think about whether we've got that cow that's in good body condition on the average in our herd that's going to produce her maximum amount of milk. We're probably not going to get the benefit out of creep feed that we would like. If, however, we've got a, a pasture full of thin two-year-olds that we're concerned about their body condition, then putting out creep feed for their calves could show us some, some economic benefits. The other side of the equation, of course, is the value of added gain. Even though these calves at this time might be bringing $1.80 a pound at weaning time, the value of each added pound is not worth that much. Just doing some calculations recently from uh, the markets in Oklahoma City, I found that the value of each added pound of gain was someplace in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 uh, cents a pound and probably is going to be less than a dollar. So that helps us then think about how much we can spend in terms of creep feed dollars in order for each extra added pound of gain on our calves. I think you want to take time 
and do the calculations on your situation to make the best decision about using creep feed this year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Thanks so much for joining us this week. I'm Lyndall Stout, and we'll see you next time at Sunup.